Greetings, everyone. My name is Felicia Walker. I'm the Supervising Naturalist at Crab Cove Visitor Center in Alameda for the East Bay Regional Park District. We're here today to share with you a collaboration between the African American Museum and Library of Oakland and the East Bay Regional Park District. Our focus is Blackbirders Week, and we're offering a virtual program to kick off our celebration. First, I'd like to introduce Di Rosario, board member representing Ward 2. Prior to his retirement, Director Rosario worked at the East Bay Regional Park District for 37 years. He was born in Oakland and raised in East Bay and represents it proudly. I'd like to hand it over to you, Director Rosario. Thank you for that introduction, Felicia. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the East Bay Regional Park District. Um, this is an incredible opportunity uh, for the Park District, and uh, I thoroughly uh, uh, welcome you to, to this program to celebrate Bird Blackbirders Week. The Park District was formed in 1934, and the visionaries there, and we continue to uh, uh, continue to forward that that vision as we continue to grow and provide access to the parks and wildlife and the environment for everyone. Um, we are now at um, 73 parks uh, and uh, 125,000 acres, 55 miles of shoreline, and uh, incredible, incredible amounts of opportunity, especially for, for people of color to, to get out and reclaim our, our, um, our heritage and our right to, to the outdoors and nature. So welcome to everyone. I uh, hope you get to enjoy this, this program in particular. Uh, we have several uh, week-long uh, events, going out and enjoying birds, uh, which I hope to join you out there as well. So welcome to everyone. Uh, and, and I'm gonna, going to introduce you to um, the, uh, the librarians from the uh, African American Museum and Library in Oakland, Veda Silva and Marco Frazier. So welcome, Veda and Marco. Thank you, Director Rosario. It is indeed my pleasure. I'm Veda Silva the Museum Project Coordinator for the African American Museum and Library. And this is, I'm so excited for a number of reasons. Uh, the collaboration with East Bay Regional Park District, this is going to be totally amazing. Also, I've been learning about the Black Birders Week, so I've been not only entertained, but educated. Tell you a little bit about this institution. We are a research institution for African-American history and culture. And we are actually celebrating our 20th anniversary. We opened up in February the 21st, 2002. So this has been a wonderful year for us and it continues as the month go by, we still keep celebrating this entire year. We have four departments here, we have an archives department. We have uh, actually our newest department is the library seed lending library. We also have the reference library and the archives department. The museum gallery is on the second floor. So those are pretty much the four departments that we have here. I'm not going to go through details with you, but I would say this. We have over 16,000 books in our reference library on African American history and culture, which does not include a rare book collection. The oldest book is 1802, and it's a journal of a Navy captain. So there's a lot of resources. So if you're in beautiful Oakland, please come by and visit us. Now to take you on a tour and give you a little bit more of the details of these four departments, I'd like to introduce my library assistant, Marco Frazier. Thank you, Vita. Um, yeah. Let me share my screen here. I think I just shared it, but I probably shared the wrong one there. Let's see here. Okay, can I get a thumbs up if you see the um, screen here? All right, so uh, welcome to the African American Museum and Library. Uh, my name is Marco Frazier, 
library assistant. And uh, what you see here are the three locations um, of the African American Museum and Library. On the left, you see the East Bay uh, Negro Historical Society. So that was the initial um, name of the organization. It started out as a storefront. Um, and for many years, it stayed at that location. And people would come in and see the different collections and things that uh, we actually had. And as people did that, more and more people began to be interested and in also donating collections and things that they had. So over time, they outgrew that space, uh, ended up at the Golden Gate Branch Library where it stayed uh, for years. And as time went on, more and more people began uh, to also show interest, more interest in donating collections and it outgrew that space as well. So we ended up here at the African American Museum and Library on 14th and MLK, where we opened in 2002. So the mission of the African American Museum and Library is to discover, preserve, interpret, and share the cultural experiences of African Americans here in Northern California for present and future generations. Uh, we have four departments, as Vita, um, Vita said, um, our archives department, our library, our museum, and our seed lending library. So those are the photos and things that uh, you see on the screen here. Now about the East Bay Negro Historical Society. Um, everything started with a group of individuals that you see here on the um, screen here. Uh, back in the 1940s, they began collecting uh, papers and oral histories of basically the African American experience of uh, different individuals. Uh, this is the home where the East Bay Negro Historical Society started. Uh, in the first meeting, there were the Fords, the Lasarda Mays, uh, Harold Mason, Maury Turner, and Madison Harvey. This was the original home that was on um, Grove Street, where they actually moved to uh, at that location, the storefront. And then this was the second one, as I was saying, as it outgrew that space uh, that they actually moved before becoming uh, also um, a name change. So we've had three different name changes. First one was the East Bay Negro Historical Society. Uh, the second name was the California Center for Afro-American History and Life. So the reason for the change was basically now we weren't just an uh, East Bay um, location focused on African-American history here in Oakland, but the Bay Area as well. And then we branched out into the, pretty much the state of California. Um, so the, the Northern California Center for Afro-American History and Life was the name. And then eventually we became the African-American Museum and Library. And as Vita said, we just celebrated uh, our 20 year anniversary actually at this location that we're at now. Uh, so we have again, four departments. This one here is a copy of our as you walk up the stairs, you'll see the mural that we have here. And I just want to point out a couple people that you that we have here. So there's a th total of three different murals, uh, mural pieces that we have up there. There's a total of about 42 different stories up there, ranging from everything from slave period all the way to talking about the migration, uh, local politicians, educators. Uh, and entertainers. So I'm just gonna point out a couple of them here. Um, this photo that you see up here, can I get a, um, a thumbs up if you see my mouse moving around? Okay, just making sure. Um, so when we talk about the uh, migration here, this one here is basically the Richmond shipyard. So this was uh, one of the um, reasons for migration here. We have World War II that ended up breaking out. And so the Richmond shipyards was one of the job opportunities that were here um, that people migrated here for. So they built over 727 ships during that time to help out 
uh, with the wartime effort. Um, this one here uh, is the oldest black church in Oakland. This is uh, Beth Eaton Baptist Church. We also have um, the stories of um, African Americans uh, and the history was basically told by this lady here. This is uh, Delalia Beasley and Beasley was a um, columnist. She wrote a newspaper article called Negroes in the News uh, that was in the Oakland Tribune uh, for many years. And also she wrote a book that she did a lot of research on called The Negro Trailblazers of California which basically gave a detailed history of uh, African-Americans basically here in California. Uh, the other two that we have here, uh, Ida Jackson. So these are also um, uh, collections that we have here too. So this is Ida Jackson. We have her collection here. She is the first African-American school teacher uh, to teach here in Oakland. We also have uh, the Black Panther Party, um, which is uh, Huey Newton here. So we also have the uh, Black Panther newspapers that are uh, in our collection here as well. We talk about the Pullman Porters. Finally, um, the Pullman Porters were uh, people that worked on the trains. So. Um, it was a respectable job in the African-American community, but they nece didn't necessarily get the respect that they deserved from the Pullman company. So people such as this, this is uh, C.L. Dellums. He was um, the vice president for the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And eventually he was able to uh, get a, so a contract basically signed by the Pullman company and the Pullman Porters. So they were the first African-American group to basically be recognized as a union in uh, the United States um, by a major corporation. We also have Ron Dellums papers here. So Ron Dellums was in Congress for 27 years, as well as um, serving as mayor of the city of Oakland as well. Uh, some of the collections that- uh, And let's uh, remind everyone, when you arrive at the African American Museum and Library and you go upstairs, you would be issued a key to that mural and it give you details of all the individuals that Marco did not speak of. Thank you, Marco. Mm -hmm. uh, so as far as the collections and things that we have here, uh, these are just some of the photos from those collections. So TJ Robinson, uh, Esther Harberry. This is TJ Robinson who had the um, gingerbread house that was here in uh, West Oakland for many years. And then as we go along the sides here, these are from the Slim Jenkins collection. So Slim Jenkins was considered the, yes. the unofficial mayor of West Oakland. Uh, so he had a nightclub, a restaurant, a liquor store, all here uh, in the heart of uh, the city of Oakland and West Oakland. Um, and also Esther Marbury here, I'm sorry. Um, um, Esther Marbury is on this side, uh, Esther's orbit room. So we also have her oral history uh, here. And basically they talk about how West Oakland was. West Oakland was basically an entertainment hub <clears throat> for um, uh, many people for many years. And she also talks about uh, the changes and things that occurred. So we're talking, uh, bringing in things such as the post office, the, um, the BART station and how all of that basically wiped out that whole entertainment hub and communities in West Oakland. So these are some of the things that you can see on our online archive of California, our Calisphere um, uh, website. So you can see oral histories and you can see the different photos and many of the documents and things that are in the collections that we've had uh, digitized. So we have over 160 collections uh, that document the African-American experience here in Oakland. Uh, these are photos from the Black Panther um, collection. Um, as I said, we also have the uh, Black Panther newspapers that we have here as well. Ida Jackson, first African-American school teacher. So she taught at Prescott School because that was one of the only schools that they would allow African-Americans to teach at. Um, however, and even for her to get the opportunity to teach, 
she had to go hundreds of miles away just to get the opportunity to come back to Oakland, um, her home, in order to um, become an educator. Uh, we also have Maury Turner's um, uh, collection here. So Maury Turner was the creator of the Wee Pals, was a, um, a comic strip that was in a newspaper throughout the country uh, for many years, syndicated signic um, comic strip. And he was one of the uh, first to actually draw uh, integ an integrated cast of characters in his comic strip. And again, these are the Pullman Porters, as I uh, talked about in the mural, C.O. Delms, uh, and uh, the Pullman Porters. Uh, these are the dining car workers. So these are the people that would uh, serve your uh, food. So they had uh, the dining car workers, they had the ticket takers, they would uh, help with your luggage uh, and things of that nature. And then here you see um, T.J. Robinson, the Gingerbread House, Slim Jenkins, uh, Ruth Beckford. She had a, a dance studio here in uh, West Oakland at the Farmery Park. So we have her papers. Uh, these photos are of Dr. William Watts, um, the Watts Collection. He was an African-American doctor here who uh, opened his... Um, who opened his um, um, hospital as a training uh, location because places such as um, uh, Highland Hospital, they would not accept uh, African-Americans into their um, uh, training programs. And we're almost done here. These are basically uh, from a Henry Delton Williams collection. So not only do we have photos um, and documents. We have other things here. So these are designs that were done by uh, Henry Delton Williams. He's a Motown designer. He's done designs for uh, people such as, um, as you see, the Supremes. Um, that's the comedian Linnell and also uh, Martha Reeves of Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. Um, we also have his oral history. So he talks about um, uh, not only the collection, but his story of uh, the migration period here. He's also in our um, um, in our exhibition upstairs, Visions Towards Tomorrow. And that is pretty much it. As I say, the museum gallery talks about Visions Towards Tomorrow, the history of African Americans in Oakland beginning with the 1890s. Um, I know I only have a short time here, so thank you for your time, and I am now going to send this to Felicia. Excellent, Marco. Thank you for that overview. There's so much inspiring history here to celebrate, to learn, and share, especially with our youth, so I hope that really brings some folks in and gets them really um, excited to learn more. Speaking of learning, we're here and we're honoring and educating about the need for programs such as Black Birders Week. Um, and so first, I'd like to give a shout out to Karina Newsom and Black AF in STEM for working to change the narrative of people of color um, enjoying and studying the natural world. So um, sparked by a racist incident in New York Central Park that went viral, backlit by the racial, racial injustices of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor's death. This initiative was created to boost recognition, representation, and begin to remove the worry about going out into natural spaces and begin be, being viewed as anything other than a nature goer. So the three main goals of Black Birders Week are to counter the narrative that outdoors are not the place for Black people, um, to educate the birding and broader outdoor loving community about the challenges black birders specifically face and encourage increased diversity in birding and conservation. So we are going to, um, we're going to move in to a program um, by Michael Charnovsky. Great to be here, everybody. 
Thank you very much. My name is Michael. I'm a naturalist with East Bay Regional Parks. And today I am going to do a program about birds of prey in the East Bay. And the reason why I chose birds of prey is because, well, first of all, I love them. Let me share again, and I'm going to turn on the sound, because guess what? For these birds of prey, I have um, lots of sound clips. I'm going to click the right button this time. I chose birds of prey because, first of all, I happen to love birds of prey. But even folks who are not really into birding, even folks who are living in you know the middle of an urban environment, there are lots of hawks. There's lots of birds of prey in our urban areas and also, of course, in our, um, you know, parklands. And so I'm really going to focus on, um, you know, the birds that we can see in both places. And, um, and not, this, these aren't all of them, but these are most of them that, that we're most likely to see in the cities and also in our parklands. I left off some of the less common ones. Now, what is a bird of prey, also known as a raptor? Well, they're carnivorous birds. They only eat meat. And there are the hawks, the eagles, the falcons, the owls, the vultures, and birds like that. So they have all have a very sharp beak, which is either used to eat meat or to kill their prey. And they also all have very sharp talons, which is also to kill their prey and, all, and to catch it. One of my favorite birds and one that does sometimes come into cities as long as there's open space nearby for them to hunt is the American kestrel falcon. And um, it's the smallest bird of prey that we have. And it's also perhaps the most colorful. This, is, this happens to be the male. The female is also colorful, but not as intensely bright. And if you hear this, You're listening to a kestrel, and so they've got this really kind of loud, shattery call, which is kind of unmistakable. It doesn't sound like any other call that we hear out there. And they hover in the air. So especially on windy days, sometimes they can do it almost effortlessly, but you'll see them hovering, and then they pounce down in a grassland or an open area for, for their prey. So it'll include, you know, insects and, and small rodents. Perhaps my favorite bird of all time, also the fastest animal in the world, is the peregrine falcon. They used to be highly endangered. There was only one or two pair in California in the 70s. People were just assuming that they were going to go extinct. They were extinct in the eastern U.S., but people... Um, bred them in captivity and released them. And also the reason for, their, for them becoming endangered, or, or there are many reasons, but the main one was the use of DDT, which is a, a broad spectrum insecticide. And it would be sprayed not only on farmlands, but also in cities to kill, you know, to kill mosquitoes. So it poisoned humans, you know, directly and indirectly. And what did it do for birds of prey? Well, these poisons, what happens is they accumulate as as the food chain gets higher. Because if something's eating something small, it has to eat a whole bunch of them. Over time, it gets a whole bunch of that poison, right? Um, and then a whole bunch of larger animals will eat, you know, larger animals will eat a whole bunch of those. And so they, they, the toxin accumulates up into the highest parts of the food chain. And that's what birds of prey are. And what it would do is make their eggshells thin, and then they couldn't support um, the eggs. So peregrine falcons, other birds I'm talking about today, osprey. Um, eagles, all of them became endangered. A and yet now all of them are, most of them are doing really, really well. So this is a great success story. But peregrines, they live in cities, unlike many birds of prey. And why is that? Because they nest on cliffs. Well, a building is like a cliff. You know, it's wide open space. They can see their prey flying. They dive down. And that's why they need that speed is because they catch other birds in the air. They're not hunting animals on the ground almost ever, now and then. But that's why they can, they can live in cities. And here is their call.
it's also one of those calls that's, that's unique. So if you hear that, and once you learn it, 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 you know that there's a peregrine in the area. If we have time later, we could click on this. This shows um, a live webcam of a peregrine falcon family on the top of a, a tower at UC Berkeley. And it's, there's a lot of people that are watching it. It's, it's, really, it's really fun to watch the birds get fed by their, by their parents. Cooper's hawk, it's about the same size as, as a peregrine falcon. These are kind of considered medium-sized birds of prey, but the Cooper's hawk actually, which most people don't know, is the most common hawk in our cities. It's also fairly common in our uh, wildlands, in our, in our parklands. Um, and they didn't used to be in cities, right? But they used to be they used to be thought of as forest birds because they're small enough that they can actually, you know, uh, fly through trees and not get, you know, not hit trees, right? Um, and that that's helped. They're really agile, and that's helped by having wide um, wings and a long tail. Um, they will catch birds in the air. They will catch animals on the ground as well. And so I, we got. We've got Cooper's hawks around Crab Cove. We've got Cooper's hawks where I live in East Oakland, and I see them all the time. and And they also, thankfully, uh, you know, keep the pigeons away uh, from my house, which I appreciate because I don't like you know pigeon poop all over my <laughs> all over my porch. So I really love them. And, and here is their unique call. And that is a hummingbird going after it. Pretty, pretty, uh, you know, brave hummingbird going after a, you know, a hawk many times its size. sharp hawks are smaller than Cooper's hawks. And this, of course, is a much different photo, but they're actually very, very similar. They look almost exactly alike. But look at the Cooper's hawk. If, if you could see it from where it's above you, a rounded tail and the sharp hawk hawk tends to have a straight tail and they're smaller so the sharp shinned hawks are even more of a, of a forest bird and that they can even get into thicker trees that, than the cooper's hawk because they're smaller and they're they're so incredibly fast just like the cooper's hawk they will surprise their prey and just you know they'll, they'll be just watching camouflage and then just you know, dive bomb after after their prey. These will also come in to cities, but they're not as common as Cooper's hawks in the city. Sometimes golden eagles fly over my house in, in, in Oakland. They're not really hunting in cities though. They're not gonna, they need wide open grasslands. But actually the, the highest concentration of golden eagles in the continental United States is in the East Bay which is pretty amazing, right? Our East Bay, especially inland Alameda and Contra Costa counties. There's just, it's such an amazing bird. And like other hawks, you know, and, and eagles, they also were hurt, you know, by, by hunting and by DDT. Although because they eat ground squirrels, there wasn't, and, and other birds on land in wild areas, they weren't as affected as much as other birds of prey because people didn't spray you know, our wildlands as much. And ground squirrels aren't like birds. They're more sedentary, right? So they're not getting, they didn't get the poison in them as much. So they did not become an endangered species like this one did, which of course is our national symbol. And um, it's about a seven foot wingspan, both bald eagles and, and golden eagles. You can also sometimes see this flying over our cities. They nest in some of our local reservoirs such as Lake Chabot and Lake Delval. And, and I also see them hunting at Martin Luther King shoreline sometimes and in our bay in general. So they're becoming more common and more widespread. Now listen to this call. So that it's a very, almost from our human perspective, perspective, it's almost kind of like a sweet sound that it's making, right? Well, when you often see movies of a bald eagle, our national symbol, they won't play this call. They'll play the call of another hawk, of another, you know, another animal. They'll play the red-tailed hawk. And because the red-tailed hawk has got this, you know, aggressive sounding call. Um, 
but the bald eagle is the, our biggest, you know, eagle around, right? So uh, it's really interesting how, but they, in movies, they often don't play the bald eagle sound. They'll play another animal sound for it. Uh, here's a bird that we don't tend to see in cities, but we will see them in marshlands next to cities. So if you're near a marshland, whether it's in Oakland near MLK shoreline, or if you're in Berkeley near East Shore State Park, places like that, um, you can see um, these birds hunting in low, in areas that are flat with lots of marshy air, you know, marshlands. And they're, they're beautiful, beautiful birds. It's hard to tell, but they have a white uh, patch on the top right here. And they're a good, a good size bird, right? They're um, not nearly as big as eagles, but about the size of a red-tailed hawk. Um, they have a, a wingspan. Well, I'll get to that in, in a moment. Um, but they're, they, they're just, they're so much fun to watch as they, as they fly really, really, really down low, you know, right, right up against the, the ground, looking for birds and other creatures to eat. Oh, the white-tailed kite. These ones um, also don't tend to come in the middle of cities, but they're more on the borderlands as long as they can hunt in grasslands. They're also at MLK shoreline, regional shoreline, um, and also in, in our um, shoreline parks where there's lots of grassland, um, and they're up in our hills. And they've got a cool call, listen to this. Yeah, it's uh, also kind of a sweet call. It doesn't, it, it doesn't sound, you know, like that intense, you know. People sometimes when they think of birds of prey, they think they must have this really intense call. Wait to hear the red-tailed hawks though, right? This is our most common bird of prey kind of in North America and in the West, well, actually in the Western United States. Um, it's not the most common in, in our urban areas, but perhaps it's our second most common. Cooper's hawk gets the, gets the number one, you know, award for that. Um, but they will absolutely go into, into cities. They've got about a five foot wingspan. These are, these are big birds, big hawks. How do you, how can you tell where they are? Because sometimes, like, before I really knew my hawks, like, it's a bird of prey. Uh, you know, it, it must be a red tail. Well, that's not actually true. I've been, I've mistakenly called birds, other birds of prey, red tails, but there is a way you can tell for sure. And it's not the red tail. Well, actually, if you see the red tail, it's a red tailed hawk, but, but only adults have red tails. Juveniles do not. So first or second year birds do not have red tails. But if you look at this dark, uh, these dark feathers here, that's what you would call diagnostic. So meaning if you see uh, a hawk with, with this dark spots right here, it's definitely a red-tailed hawk. Now listen to this call. So that's the one that often gets played in movies, even if it's a bald eagle fly, right? Because it, people think of it as the, uh, you know, like the aggressive call. They're so beautiful and they're out hunting. In cities, they're catching squirrels they're catching um, pigeons and rats. Perhaps our most beautiful hawk that does come into the city is the red-shouldered hawk. Um, it, they do need some open space, so you won't tend to see them in the middle of the most urban areas. But I mean, they fly over my house in, in East Oakland, and you know, and I a, there's not that much open space around me. So um, you know, um, but you cannot. You cannot mistake their call. Listen to this. It's loud, right? It's, it really is loud. So you, you can hear them from, from really far away. Um, and, and they're a medium-sized hawk about the size of a Cooper's hawk or a peregrine, not like a red tail. Um, and you can see this coloration if the, if the lighting is right. They really are gorgeous. Not just hawks, not just falcons, but we have owls in the city and of course in our parklands. Um, this is the most common hawk in our urban areas. And I've seen them around my house, but didn't know where they nest. And then one day I was walking underneath a palm tree 
which was two blocks away. And I didn't see the owl, but I saw its poop and I saw the owl pellets, dozens of them. So I looked up and there it was. Actually, there were, there were three of them up there. So they had had, you know, babies that year. Um, and they were extremely well camouflaged up there. It was quite interesting. Something about palm trees, they love me, even though this is not a species native to this area. They will nest in trees and stick nests, or they'll even in cavities, you know, but they will also just nest on palm trees and, and other trees too. So um, I, I do suspect that that a lot of our barn owls and other red tails, they're getting poisoned by, by rat poison. Here's the negative part of, of this conversation. And something I'd like to educate the public is that rat poison doesn't just kill rats, right? It kills our birds of prey. And so I really encourage people to try to control rodents without using poisons because you're killing, if we, if we use rat poison, we're also killing these beautiful birds, right? And then ironically, guess what happens? Our hawks and, and owls are no longer around. And then the rats, you know, when, when the poison goes away, the rats come back, but there's no natural predators to kill them. So please, let's take care of our birds of prey by not using rat poison. Um, they also, this, and this call, check this out. Do you hear that? I'll, do, I'll play it one more time. That's its most common call. It's kind of this shriek. It's not a pleasant call by us, by our human standards, but that's what you mostly hear, unless there's babies, in which case they do all kinds of strange noises, right? Um, they're very well camouflaged, but yet you can see this, this kind of interesting looking face. Um, they have, uh, and this, if a light shines on it, this is pretty bright at night and their eyes are huge, right? They have great eyesight, but they have, this is a, they have incredible hearing. They can hear, they can catch prey just using their hearing, right? Incredible. Here's our biggest owl, and they are also an urban owl as well. Um, not as common as barn owls in the urban environment, but they do come in. They, they don't really nest as often in the middle of cities, um, but they do now and then. But they're more common in the borderlands where, where the city meets the, meets the forest. And you will probably recognize this call. So that was a male and a female um, calling back and forth to each other. The male call is higher, the female is lower. And um, interestingly, I don't know if it's related to that, but what's the difference between male and female birds of prey? Well, in general, males are considerably smaller than the females. Uh, females are almost always larger and sometimes considerably larger um, than, than the males. And I've tried to figure out why that might be. And scientists honestly just don't, don't really know. I mean, there's theories, but you know, they, they don't know yet. But that's that's something to you know, to think about when you see two next to each other, they might be the same species, but one might look a lot bigger. Now, here is another call by the great horned owl. <coughs> they also screech. It's not just the barn owl that screeches. It sounds a little different than the barn owl, but, um, I have heard great horned owl screeching and I didn't know it was a great horned owl, you know. And then I was su really surprised to see this large owl, you know. Um, and, and, you know, the great horns, right? See the, the feathers sticking up? But those actually are more for communication amongst each other. Uh, they don't really do much else. Um, communication is very important. So it's, you know, I'm not saying it's not important, but their ears are down lower. And like the bar now, they have one ear that's slightly above the other. And that really helps them, really helps them focus on where uh, 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 their prey is, right? Uh, keep your eyes open. You never know when you might see a great horned owl or a bar now in your area. Now, here's one that this will not live in the middle uh, of a city, but it will live in our grasslands that, you know, an open space that might be surrounded by city like MLK regional shoreline. Um, 
like East Shore State Park. Um, they come at it during the daytime and they use ground squirrel nests as their home. They don't actually really construct their own burrows, although they will, you know, uh, improve them. Um, but they will absolutely use ground, mostly ground squirrel nests as their, as their home. And they're out catching insects and small rodents during the daytime. So if you can get to a place where you know there's burrowing owls, it's such a wonderful sight to see these. And here's a bird that's not a hawk or a falcon or an owl, it's an osprey. 20 something years ago, there were no osprey nesting around the bay. They were also became endangered because of, of DDT, just like bald eagles and peregrine falcons. Fish eaters, that's what they catch. And so the, you know, the, the bioaccumulation in fish in our bays and our oceans are quite intense. Um, now there's dozens of, of hawk of osprey nests around the bay. And here is um, uh, a link to a live webcam uh, of an osprey pair in, in Richmond. And they have two babies right now. And they're just, it's so much fun to watch. Listen to their call. So also, I mean, more of a, what we might consider a sweet call, right? You know, th this is how they communicate with each other. I, I don't know why some animals have different birds of prey have one completely different calls than the other. Um, but from our human point of view, this is, this is more of a sweet call. Um, these are powerful birds. I mean, they're, you know, six foot-ish wingspan. They're catching fish, right? And sometimes other animals near the water, but mostly fish. And they'll nest on human-made structures as well, but they put sticks there. I, I used to see these in Los Angeles flying over my house. I lived in the city, right? But there was some parkland nearby and, um, and I always thought that they were hawks. And one day I come back from college, I, I knew better. And I tell my dad, these are vultures. He didn't believe me. He did. My dad didn't believe me. So I had to show him pictures and finally he believed me. But yeah, there's turkey vultures are not hawks. They're, they eat dead, you know, dead animals. They're not killing um, their, their prey. They just find dead stuff. So you especially see them around roadkill, right? That's where we urban, you know, folks tend to see them. Um, but they will uh, sometimes they'll even roost in cities and yet go up into our parklands for the daytime. Right? They, they do that in San Leandro area and Hayward and, you know, parts of Oakland as well. And they have a, a, a bald head. And that's because, well, you know, where are they sticking that head? Inside of dead, rotten animals to get their meat, right? Well, if you had feathers covering your head, uh, that would get kind of gross. And it would, get, and it would lead to infections and, and stuff. So, you know, so that's why um, vultures have a bald head. And like a six foot-ish wingspan. These are, these are big birds. And to end it, uh, end my presentation, I would like to say that someday, even flying over cities some, someday soon, maybe we'll start seeing this bird, the largest bird in California, the California condor, still highly, highly endangered, but not as much as it was 40 years ago or, you know, 30 years ago. Um, they're, you, you can see them around Pinnacles National Park, Big Sur. They're just releasing them up north in, in, uh, in, in the Redwoods. Um, they're at Grand Canyon. They're in other places. Um, but there's one recently that came from Pinnacles and flew up around Mount Diablo and then went back down south. So you never know. We might get to see these soon. And I wanted to thank you. And I would like to encourage everybody, both in the cities, in the borderlands, between city and parks and in the parklands, keep your ears and your eyes open. Look up around and you never know what birds of prey you might get to see. Thank you, Michael, so much. Um, I want to remind all of our viewers, if you're interested in learning more about um, wildlife, simply visit um, East Bay Regional Park website, that's ebparks.org, or you can call a visitor center and learn about the programming that's offered by our naturalists. Um, so 
while we're um, still here, we're wrapping up a little bit. Um, I wanted to also thank um, our partners at the African American Museum and Library of Oakland, Ms. Vida Silva and Marco Frazier. Thank you so much for um, all that you do and partnering with us. And um, remind everyone that the East Bay Regional Park District is offering seven in-person walks for Black Birders Week. And we begin on Sunday, May 29th. And that is going to be the full week all the way through Saturday, June 4th. So visit um, ebparks.org to get the details. And please continue to support, advocate, and appreciate the natural world and others who do the same. Enjoy visiting the African American Museum and Library of Oakland and your East Bay Regional Parks. See you on the trails. Thanks, everybody.